Hello and welcome to this webinar. So um, I will explain how we use the Tumormax media to generate primary cell cultures and derive cell lines from this. I will start with a short introduction on tumor models in general um, and then also explain um, the workflow that we used um, and then give you some exemplary data ex and explain a few details about the uh, tumor cell lines and cultures that we generate. So let's take a look at the different tumor models that you can use in uh, cancer research and preclinical testing. Uh, so you see an overview of different models. And um, of course, there are some quite exotic ones like the zebrafish, which is also quite commonly used uh, these days. But uh, I think the most important models that you can see here are uh, on the one hand, uh, the in vitro models that we have, so 2D and 3D uh, cultures. And then, of course, we also have the xenograft models, so in uh, vivo models that you can use for more complex uh, assays and um, yeah, studies that you want to do. So the in vitro models, um, you have uh, cell lines, 2D cell lines that you can order and simply put them in a dish and they will grow. So they are quite easy to propagate. And uh, of course, since they just grow in a dish, uh, you can easily manipulate them and add compounds and do testing or whatever you want to do with them. And uh, basically, you only need a cell culture lab uh, to run uh, in vitro tests. For the xenograft models, um, these are mainly used when you have more complex testing, of course, because uh, you have uh, tissues, so organs, more or less, growing in a mouse. And uh, you can do studies like biodistribution and more complex uh, readouts because uh, the tumors that will grow in a mouse will uh, more closely resemble the patient tumor. On the other hand, um, growing tumors in mice is quite expensive because the mice themselves uh, are not too cheap. You need the facilities and ethic approvals. And of course, you need all the infrastructure for maintaining uh, immunodeficient mice. And um, one quite important aspect, at least when we talk about PDX models, so patient-derived xenografts, you graft uh, pieces of tumor tissue into an animal. And if you want to expand it, so if you want to generate more of this tissue in order to run larger cohorts for your testing, this always means that you have to expand the, uh, the tissue on animals, which is quite costly and uh, something to consider. When we now take a closer look on uh, in vitro models, um, you see the division. So it's a table here and um, we divided them into the traditional or classical cell lines. So uh, like HeLa cells or MCF7 cells that you can simply order um, uh, on diff from different vendors. Uh, and then we have the primary cell lines on the very right hand side. So um, cells that you can passage and cryopreserve and so on, but also more short term uh, cell cultures. And uh, when we first take a look at the um, at traditional cell lines, of course, you uh, see um, hundreds of papers on uh, what they can do and cannot do, what they express and what has been tested on them. So they are very well characterized and studied. Uh, when you look at primary cell cultures or cell lines, so primary cells derived from patient tissues, of course, they have all the patient-specific features and mutations which can be an advantage if you want to uh, look more into detail in personal medicine, for example. But on the other hand, of course, this means that whenever you set up a model using primary cells, you have to individually characterize the cells and the model that you are using. Um, when we now look at in, viv in vivo models that you could generate from cell lines, when you look at the traditional ones, of course, um, these cells have been passaged for um, hundreds of um, passages already in vitro. So um, the cells that you have are quite homogeneous. Once you inject them into mice, they will also form quite homogeneous xenograft models. Uh, upon this extensive propagation in vitro, they might lose some tumor initiating capacity. And um, due to these homogeneous tumors that they form in vivo, of course, the, the recapitulation of patient tumors is quite limited, so they do not really look like patient tumors. When we now look at primary cells, um, since they keep all the patient-specific uh, features, they also keep the patient-specific uh, subtypes of tumor cells, so they really um, recapit uh, uh, recapitulate the patient tumor heterogeneity. Uh, they preserve tumor initiating capacity, uh, so that means you can always also generate in vivo xenograft models from the tumors or tumor cell lines that you have, which is not always true for the 
classical cell lines. And again, they keep all the patient-specific features, which is a plus when you look at personalized medicine. But of course, uh, you have to characterize them first. Then finally, when you look at the more um, yeah, technical aspects, uh, traditional cell lines are really easy to um, get. You can simply order them from different vendors. You order them, you put them in culture, and you're uh, almost good to go for your uh, in vitro testing. Uh, the media that I use are quite simple. So you have a um, quite simple basal, basal medium like RPMI or DMEM, and you add serum 10 or 20%. Which makes it quite uh, inexpensive and easy to um, generate, but of course, serum is largely undefined, and uh, you you don't really know what you put into your uh, in vitro model when you add serum. On the other hand, you can uh, just passage them for hundreds of passages, and they will still grow, and you can still do your in vitro testing. Now, when we look at the primary cells again. Um, you can't just order them anywhere. You need access to primary uh, biopsies, of course. Uh, usually uh, from hospitals, you need to get them. You need patient consent, so it's a little bit more complicated. Um, and then also when you want to use media, um, there's only a limited amount of off-the-shelf media. So this basically means that um, you can either start developing your own homebrew medium, but uh, then you need to test different uh, concentrations of cytokines and growth factors not only for one tumor entity. So once you have um, a medium that works good for one tumor entity, uh, you basically have to change uh, a lot of things to make it work for another tumor entity as well. And then, um, as briefly mentioned in the beginning, the primary cell cultures. Um, you can put cells in culture. They will adhere, and um, you can keep them for up to four weeks, let's, let's say. But um, for some patients, the cells simply stop growing, stop, uh, stop proliferating, and uh, this leaves you with a time frame of two to four weeks to perform your in vitro assays, whereas when you have cells that um, do not stop uh, proliferating, you uh, can actually treat them like traditional cell lines, so passage them over and over, and um, yeah, have an in vitro model that you can just cryopreserve and thaw whenever you need it. So let's continue with uh, the workflow. So of course, when you want to generate your own cell line, you start with a solid um, tissue biopsy, and um, you need some material to start your cell lines. Uh, we have this um, optimized workflow. So we start with a solid, with a solid tumor, and at least in our case, um, we mainly get them from hospitals, so they need to be shipped overnight, and we have the max tissue storage solution to. Um, also store uh, the cells overnight during the transport. From this, um, we take the tumor biopsy, the solid biopsy out of the uh, transport medium, so to say, and perform tissue dissociation with the Gentlemax Octo and our tumor dissociation kit, human in this case. And um, this is followed then, so we get a single cell suspension and then isolate tumor cells. So uh, when we have um, primary patient tumors, it's of course a tumor cell isolation kit, human. But when we talk about xenografts, you have um, mouse host cells contaminating your tumor cells. So we use the mouse uh, cell depletion kit. And this is then followed by um, just taking the cells that you isolated and um, resuspend them in tumor max media and grow your cell lines. After the um, dissociation or also after um, cell isolation, we uh, phenotype the cells. And um, it's also not a bad idea to also phenotype uh, a cell line uh, once in a while to see whether there are some changes or something that is not really expected. So this is, of course, done with flow cytometry because it's quite easy. And uh, for this, we have the cytometers and the um, antibodies. So um, this workflow, we don't always just follow this workflow and always work with isolated tumor cells. The transport medium, We've seen in the past that um, during the transfer, there are also some cells released from the uh, solid tumor biopsy. So what we tend to do is to just take the transportation medium, spin it down, and when you see a nice pellet, you know that you have a lot of tumor cells uh, and also other cells in there. And we simply uh, resuspend the pellet in tumor max media and also use this as um, yeah, material to start the culture. Um, and the same is also true for the tumor dissociation. Um, when you choose conditions where the T 
tissue is not completely digested, but after finishing the program on the device, you may have some, some chunks of tissue and want to uh, go for explant cultures. Uh, we've seen that it's advantageous to um, take these um, pieces or chunks of tissue um, after dissociation when you filter the cell suspension and just uh, pick up the pieces from uh, the filter that you use and also resuspend them in tumor mox media and uh, grow, grow your cells. So this leaves us with actually isolated tumor cells. So this would be one kind of starting material. Then um, the chunks after dissociation, the second type of material that we use, and then also the cells that we can recover from the transportation medium. So this is the basic workflow that we, that we use. I'd like to give you some information on the different um, parts of the workflow. So first of all, the tissue storage solution. This is, as I said, just a, a transportation medium, and it has been optimized to um, yeah, store tissues for up to 48 hours. Um, so uh, whenever the shipment takes longer than 24 hours or uh, even just overnight, uh, we've validated up to 48 hours. And uh, we know that, as you can see down here, the cell viability is preserved during that time. Um, we always used fresh tissue to compare it to, so freshly dissociated tissue, and then either stored it for 24 hours or 48 hours. And as you can see, the viability, uh, viability is preserved. Uh, one other quite important aspect um, about the tissue storage solution is that it uh, do not, does not contain any harmful agents. So nothing to fix cells, so it's uh, compatible with any downstream application for that require uh, requires viable cells. For the tissue dissociation, um, I briefly mentioned the Gentomax Octo. Uh, you see it down here. It's um, a fully automated system. So uh, once you put uh, this, uh, the uh, tube with the tissue uh, and the enzyme mix on the device, you can press play and walk away. So of course, this is more uh, user independent. Uh, we have eight uh, individual positions on the device, so you can run um, eight different samples or eight different tissues even, and have a quite parallelized um, yeah, workflow. Um, and the whole system is closed, which is very important when you use um, human material um, because it's user safe. Then we have the, the enzyme mixes, so the tumor dissociation kits, which are optimized for tumor uh, biopsies. And we use highly pure enzymes, so purified enzymes that ensure a lot-to-lot -lot consistency and um, always the same activity that you use in your um, dissociation. Uh, so there's nothing um, you need to be afraid of when you use a new lot. It's uh, the same activity, no side effects or side uh, activity, and it's quite standardized. The cell viability, of course, is preserved because we want to uh, recover viable cell suspensions to do downstream uh, exp uh, experiments. And then also um, key epitopes are uh, preserved. We have for both uh, both of the tumor dissociation kits, so for human and for mouse, we have whole lists of um, epitopes um, that we tested for stability. So you can always check whether the epitope you want to look at um, downstream is uh, preserved or there's one component that you might want to reduce and then uh, preserve the epitope, but everything is written in the data sheet. Just one more uh, aspect about tumor dissociation. So we've heard uh, quite often, so when you look at tumors, of course, uh, there are also blood-derived cells, so tumor infiltrating cells in the tissue. And um, you might think, okay, they are infiltrated from blood vessels and they are not really toughly connected uh, within the tissue. Uh, and that's where we wanted to check for um, uh, for this. So you could think when they're just like loosely lying in the tissue, you don't have to use enzymes. But uh, we compared this, uh, in this case for a mouse tumor, you see the dissociation with enzymes and without enzymes. And we looked at uh, T cells, so TIM3 P1 positive ones or LEC3 PD1 positive ones. And as you can see, although they should not really be um, yeah, sticking to other cells within the tissue, you do not recover them if you do not use enzymes at all and just focus on the mechanical dissociation. Whereas when you use enzymes, uh, of course, they support the whole uh, dissociation process and you yield a lot of uh, T cells. So um, from the tumor dissociation, um, I mentioned the, the tumor cell isolation. And there are actually three different scenarios you can uh, think of. Uh, when you have human tumor biopsies, you have human cells growing in a human. So the biopsy contains uh, tumor cells. 
after a tissue dissociation, the single cell suspension is then isolated using the tumor cell isolation kit human, which will uh, label the human non-tumor cells and remove them. When, you, when we talk about um, human xenotransplanted tissue, so you have human tumor cells growing in a mouse, um, it's still more or less a human tumor, so we use the human tumor dissociation kit. But when we want to isolate tumor cells, we use the mouse cell depletion kit, which labels all the um, host-derived non-tumor cells and removes them. And of course, uh, the third situation, when you work with uh, mouse models, syngenetic mouse models or genetically induced ones, um, you have mouse cells growing in a mouse, but we won't uh, focus on this in the webinar of today. The tumor isolation kits that we developed um, all rely on labeling the non-tumor cells. So um, no matter what kind of tumor you're working with, you do not know, uh, you do not have to know specifically about the markers that are expressed in order to enrich the cells that you want. You can rather just remove the cells you do not want. So um, it's quite easy and applicable for a wide range of tumors. But at the same time, the cells that you cover and that you want to isolate, they are free of uh, any beads and uh, free of any labels. So you can uh, perform another um, magnetically, um, uh, so a magnetic cell separation, or um, also uh, since there are no labels on the cells, you can also uh, do any kind of phenotyping and do not worry about any uh, issues with block epitopes or something like that. So you uh, recover bead-free, label-free, highly pure tumor cells. And all these kits have also been um, tested on the Automax, so automation is also possible for those three kits. Now, a few examples for isolation of uh, tumor cells. The first example is a human tumor. Um, it's actually a pleural effusion that we received from um, an ovarian cancer patient. And um, before the isolation, so the bulk um, material, so to say, as you can see here, only contains um, a, a small fraction of uh, epithelial tumor cells expressing uh, EPCAM. Um, we use, for example, CD31 to stain endothelial cells, or uh, in this plot, uh, CD45 to uh, stain uh, leukocytes, and you see that there is quite some contamination here. Um, when we use the tumor cell isolation kit, although it's not a solid tumor in this case, uh, you can still use the kit and isolate, highly enrich the, the tumor cells, so you see um, yeah, a highly pure population of EPCAM expressing cells without any um, remaining endothelial or blood cells. This also affects culture. So, of course, you can put the uh, pleural effusion as it is, just spin it down, we suspend it into tumor max medium. But as you can see here, this is the original fraction. You see some tumor cells that attached, but uh, when you take a closer look, you see lots of debris. And there are some areas here that um, the tumor cells can attach, basically because the debris is lying under it. So it's also, in many cases, also uh, advised to uh, first perform tumor cell isolation. As you can see here, you end up with really high, highly pure uh, cultures of tumor cells, um, hardly any debris and un hardly any unwanted cells. The next example is the mouse cell depletion kit. You just uh, see the uh, principle up here. So all host derived, so mouse non-tumor cells are labeled with beads. The tumor cells, so your cells of interest, um, do not get a label. So um, the negative fraction, the untouched uh, touch fraction contains the tumor cells. And you can also, if you want, elude the positive fractions or the mouse cells in case you have any downstream application where this is important. And uh, you see the, the staining here. So you see a small fraction of EPCAM expressing cells before the isolation. You see all the host-derived mouse cells down here. Uh, after the isolation, you have a pure population of human tumor cells. And if you need them and want them, you can also isolate the mouse cells uh, that you see down here and also do downstream applications with those. We also have some examples of cultures here. So when you just played the bulk cells after dissociation, um, you see that uh, you grow some human tumor cells. We stamp them with a human-specific EPCAM antibody in green here. Um, and uh, But you also see, and this was uh, taken after five days, that you have a lot of um, mouse cells. In this case, we used a, a Vimatin antibody for the mouse stromal cells. And you can imagine if you leave these cells for another f five days, for example, um, you will end up with mostly uh, mouse cells and uh, the precious tumor cells are gone. 
if you just isolate the tumor cells, you see that you have highly pure cultures of tumor cells and you can hardly find some stromal cells in there. So this is a good way to save your uh, tumor cells from being overgrown by uh, non-target uh, cells. Let's finally take a look at the tumor mux media themselves. So uh, the first important part um, you should notice is that uh, the tumor, me tumor mux media are tumor, uh, tumor type specific. So um, we've already released the pancreas, ovarian, and renal specific medium, and uh, the colon specific medium uh, will be released in Q4 this year. And we're working on more uh, tumor, um, tumor mux media. Um, as I said initially, uh, you need to optimize the composition uh, of growth factors and cytokines for each and every tumor uh, cell type, and um, we've done this. Uh, so this is something you can buy off the shelf and use for your specific tumor cells. They do not contain serum, so this means that they will not really support the growth of uh, fibroblasts, and they are defined, so we do not have serum, and we really know what's in there and uh, can use those media. Um, by choosing the right um, growth factors for the specific uh, tumor subtypes, they also specifically uh, support the growth of tumor cells. So um, we have optimized those uh, media for uh, supporting the growth of cells directly derived from, from primary tissues, so from solid tumor biopsies. They are not optimized for growing MCF7 or something like this in those media. They are really uh, for you to generate uh, your own um, primary tumor-derived uh, cell lines and cell cultures. Um, as I said, that so some uh, cells just uh, grow for like up to four weeks, but um, we've optimized the media in a way that uh, the success rate for generation of uh, stable primary cell lines uh, is uh, significantly uh, increased uh, while preserving the heterogeneity that you observe in the parental tumor. Um, the, cell, the tumor media do not uh, force the cells to grow in an adherent state or in a suspension state. So this is a cell intrinsic and tumor intrinsic feature of different uh, patient materials. And you can observe both adherent and uh, suspension growth. Uh, and I will show some examples later on. Uh, it's just important to know that um, if you don't see cells attaching, this doesn't mean it didn't work. Uh, your tumor cells simply might grow in a suspension uh, state. And finally, you can also generate um, 3D models, so embed the cells and grow um, tumoroid-like structures or spheroids. Um, this is also possible using the tumor max media. So all in all, you can generate your own um, primary tumor cell lines and uh, have improved in vitro models that really recap uh, recapitulate what you see in a patient. So if you want to use the media, it's it's really easy. As I said, you just take the, the fraction or the material that you want to start a culture with. Um, if you have a single cell suspension, we recommend to uh, plate 200,000 cells per square centimeter. Um, and yes, they are incubated at 37 degrees, um, as for also other media, of course, um, at 5 to 7.5% CO2. Uh, once you've plated the cells, you should change the media every three to four, uh, three to four days. Or, um, of course, when the cells start consuming a lot of medium also earlier when it turns yellowish um, to support the cells with uh, fresh growth factors and um, more nutrients. And once the cells reach a confluency of 80 to 90 percent, uh, you might have some fibroblasts in there that could grow. Um, you should first remove them and let the tumor cells sit and also grow more. If you have um, 80 to 90 percent confluent tumor cells, uh, that would be the time where you passage them and um, reseed them into a new vessel, um, for example, a bigger vessel if you want to expand them or uh, start your um, in vitro assays. As I pointed out earlier, um, this is the, the basic workflow that you use to just you know grow the cells and um, supply them with new nutrients and uh, passage them. But you can grow them from different um, from different um, starting materials, and uh, I'd like to stress this point because this is quite uh, important, as you will see on the next slide. So um, again, you can use the transportation medium by just uh, spinning down whatever you have after uh, the tumor biopsies have been um, yeah, shipped to your site, uh, and uh, grow cells from there. You can also, um, if you prefer explant cultures, we've seen that um, instead of just you know cutting a piece of the tissue and um, putting it in a dish, 
uh, we've seen that um, um, some kind of pretreatment or a treatment with the enzymes we have in our tumor dissociation kits is very beneficial. So the cells really grow much more efficient out of the pieces that have seen enzyme before. Um, then, of course, tumor digest is also a good starting material, uh, especially since this is single cell sus uh, suspensions where you can do cell counting and really play it defined numbers of cells. If you do phenotyping, you also know the composition of the cells that you played. So uh, this is an ideal uh, starting material and also good to know what you are actually putting into culture. And then, of course, if you are only um, interested in certain subpopulations from tumor tissues, um, this might be simply all tumor cells. Um, you can use um, either this negative enrichment that I showed, so you recover label-free cells, or for carcinoma, you can use EPCAM microbeads, so isolating all carcinoma cells, or you can also, of course, go for more specific um, subpopulations, CD4, T4 positive, or AGR5 positive um, cancer stem cell-like cells. So this is all possible. And if you have the opportunity, you should also uh, not focus on only one of these uh, options that you have, but play it, uh, cells from different um, fractions or from different materials in order to enhance your uh, success rate for cell lines or cell cultures. Now, um, here's an example of um, uh, pancreatic uh, xenografts that we played it. Um, and here you exactly see these uh, different uh, starting materials that you can use. So this is tumor digest, so just what you recover after the tumor uh, dissociation, a single cell suspension that you can count and um, play it in a more defined way. Uh, we've isolated tumor cells, so uh, this fraction doesn't contain any fibroblasts or any epithelial cells also on. And uh, finally, we've also tested explant cultures. And as you can see from the pictures already, um, for the tumor digest, we saw that most of the fibroblasts uh, within the uh, tumor sample attached, but we hardly saw any uh, tumor cells. The most successful way for this very um, patient material was the isolation of tumor cells and grow growing highly pure tumor cells, and also the explant cultures. Um, so this is an area where we moved the, we removed the piece to see whether cells attached. Uh, also here you see that we, we hardly have any, any tumor cells. So here comes the example from another um, patient xenograft um, that we um, also took three different fractions of. Again, the tumor digest here, hardly any cells, only some fibroblasts. Now isolated tumor cells, and in this case, you also do not really see attachment of cells. But then when you look at the, the cells that grew out of um, yeah, tissue pieces, you really see that you have nice colonies of uh, tumor cells. And this is just to point out uh, the material that you are you, that you will be more su successful with. This is also a feature that is um, tumor or patient specific, and that's why we would always recommend, if possible, to play it material from different fractions within the workflow uh, to make sure that you end up with tumor cell cultures and tumor cell lines. I mentioned that um, the tumor max media do not force the cells to grow in a specific state. And what you can see here is um, early passage cultures and a late passage cell line from uh, primary human pancreatic cancer, so not xenotransplanted, but directly derived from the patient biopsy. And um, when you look at the early passage, the cells from these two examples are from the very same patient. So you see that uh, adherent cells and colonies attach and nicely grow, grow and expand. Uh, during the early passage, you see some fibroblasts here that we got rid of in the late passage, and we ended up with uh, an adherent cell line from this patient. But at the same time, uh, during very early phases of the culture, we saw that um, there were always some, some cells and some, some spheres uh, in the supernatant of uh, this uh, cell culture. So at one point, we decided to um, separate them, so grow the adherent cells um, exclusively adherent and then transfer the supernatant to a new vessel. And as you can see here, um, there were some spheres that formed, and later on, you could really passage them several times, and they would always, although these were not ultra-low attachment plates, they always formed these uh, spheroids and grew as a suspension cell line that we ended up with. Another option that you have, and this is primary human uh, colon cancer, um, you can embed the cells in, in matrigel, uh, for example, or another ECM, 
um, and grow two more roids or more three roid light cultures. And again, you see the early passage cells up here. Um, here's a quite um, big colony or a big uh, tumoroid. Um, and you see that there are still some um, yeah, small um, yeah, cells around. Uh, once you passage the cells for several times, you see that they really grow um, as uh, tumoroids and these uh, single cells um, more or less disappear. Uh, and you have a 3D model that you can do um, more advanced testing with. Um, this is just another example for the um, that should show that um, it's really an uh, intrinsic uh, feature of the cells, whether they grow as 2D cells or you can also uh, cultivate them as 3D cells. This is um, a colon cancer xenograft and um, we just plated the cells and saw nice colonies after a while. Uh, but always saw these, these cells that were floating around. So um, when we uh, had the cells just sitting there for um, a longer time, we realized that they really always also tended to release cells from the material cultures to the supernatant. Uh, so we just decided to try and uh, take some of the cells also um, harvest um, the whole cell line with trypsin, um, generate single cells, and then grow them on ultra low uh, attachment plate. And for this very material, we saw that on ultra low attachment plate, um, a nice suspension cell line was generated. And um, we could also um, propagate them as um, a real suspension cell line that formed um, spheroid like, like structures. So whenever you see some floating cells in your, um, in your cultures or in your uh, cell lines, don't be frustrated. They might just want to uh, grow as uh, suspension cells. So you can, uh, at this point, just try to take the supernatant and transfer them to ultra low attachment place or embed them in ECM. And you will see that in some or in quite many cases, um, they will also grow as uh, 3D uh, structures, either as, as spheroids or as more complex tumoroids that um, might show some, some polarization of cells, for example. Um, another quite handy uh, thing that we realized um, during the um, generation of different cell lines um, is uh, that uh, you can also use uh, uh, rho kinase inhibitors to enhance the um, plating of cells. So uh, the top picture shows cells that we just um, put into culture. So it's, it was um, at this point already an Aterian cell lines. And uh, these cells we just tore, uh, so they were cryopreserved. We wanted to put them back in culture. And um, we observed many times that only really few cells attached and grew. So we decided to test uh, uh, kinase inhibitors. In this case, it's uh, the Y compound. And as you can see here, uh, the, the plating efficiency of the cells is much uh, better. And you see that the cells really plate and uh, or directly start growing. So this is something you should consider um, either during early passages of your cell cultures. So um, for example, when you plate the, directly after you um, recovered the cells from the biopsies and plate them, you can uh, add ROC inhibitors, but also um, during the, let's say up to passage five, it's quite handy. And also when you um, put the cells back in culture after you cryopreserve them, this can be really helpful and handy. Um, another thing that might enhance the um, plating of cells is the addition of serum. Um, so the tumor max media, media are serum free to have defined media. But um, for example, when you have co-cultures or something like that, you might want to add serum and um, this will enhance uh, plating or can enhance plating of the tumor cells. You see cells, ovarian uh, tumor cells plated here in the top picture and uh, this uh, approach didn't contain any serum and you see nice um, and pure tumor cell culture. When you add uh, serum, the tumor cells will still grow as you see in the uh, bottom picture here. But um, serum will, of course, really support the growth of fibroblasts. So as you can see here, there are lots of fibroblasts all over the culture. So um, the, with the addition of serum, you should be quite, quite careful because this will support fibroblasts and then they can really efficiently grow in your culture. We have now some, some, so to say, applications for the tumor max media. And the first thing um, I'd like to share with you is um, the, the, the uh, heterogeneity of cells that you have um, in the 
tumor tissue is really preserved when you generate cell lines uh, using tumor max media. So you see H&E stains from um, uh, um, sections of uh, primary tumor uh, tissues. It's for different uh, tumor materials. And this is really derived from the, from the patient. So you see um, some stromal cells, you see uh, tumor cells growing here. And uh, for this um, patient, you see some cyst-like structures. This patient has less, and uh, you see more um, mixture with, with, so not really clear stromal and tumor cell parts. And here you don't have any cysts, and um, it looks quite different. So, um, of course, when you now take a piece of this um, uh, tumor biopsy and implant it into a mouse, you have a patient-derived xenograft, which will resemble um, the, uh, the patient tumor. So, um, because you basically um, graft um, a piece of tissue, so you have the tissue uh, architecture in there. Um, within the first passages on mice, um, the stromal cells might be replaced by the host cells, but um, the tissue architecture will look quite similar to the patient tumor. Um, we've then derived cell lines from those patient tumors. You can see in the pictures here. Um, these are different tumors, but um, they look different in vitro, but you can't really uh, conclude um, from the pictures of the cultures what uh, the patient tumor might have looked like. But uh, the important part, when you now take these cells, harvest them, and implant them back into a mouse, you will see a tumor that uh, closely resembles what you've seen in the patient. So uh, the first tumor, uh, again, formed these cysts. And you see, um, in this case now, a little bit reduced, but the stromal parts here, uh, whereas the last tumor, for example, doesn't show any cyst-like structures. But um, although they have been in vitro for some while, they still look like um, they looked in the patient when you bring them back into uh, um, um, a host environment where they have um, where they can be attached to vessels and uh, start growing um, a solid tumor. And this is in contrast to what you will see when you use classical or traditional cell lines. So this is a, a xenograft model um, derived from PANC1 cells or pancreatic cancer. A cell line that is that is widely used, and it basically you see a mass of homogeneous uh, cell, uh, pancreatic tumor cells just growing in the mouse, and all the um, tissue architecture is basically lost or does not uh, resemble what you see in patients. So this is a really nice way to expand tumor cells in vitro because it's easy and inexpensive. But once you want to study something um, in in vivo in a more complex setting. Uh, you can inject those cell lines and you will have a, um, a xenograft a tumor that really resembles what you saw in the patient in the first place. Um, so I've told you that the cell lines can be grown over uh, several passages and um, they will also uh, still resemble the, the tumor um, that they were derived from. But um, another really important feature is that these cell lines are also genetically uh, stable. So we've performed uh, gene expression uh, profiling from early stage uh, cell lines. So these are three different uh, pancreatic cancer cell lines. And uh, we've used the, the early uh, stage, which was uh, passage 5, and uh, compared it to late passage uh, cell lines. This was uh, passage 15. And when you look at the uh, gene expression profiles, you see that you have a really high correlation between the early passage and the late passage, which means that uh, during the course of expanding them in vitro and you know maybe freezing them, putting them back in culture, they do not acquire a high um, amount of different mutations, but stay uh, stable and uh, do not really change a lot. We tested the same for uh, xenograft versus uh, initial, so the xenograft that was derived from a cell line uh, versus the initial patient tumor. So you see the patient tumor up here and compared to the cell line derived um, xenograft. And also here you say that you have really high um, uh, correlations between the patient tumor and the cell line derived tumor, uh, which again shows that the case, uh, patient specific features are uh, kept uh, during uh, in vitro uh, passaging, but then also when you generate an in vivo uh, model from those cell lines. And then something that you also uh, quite frequently study is, of course, the marker expression, uh, for example, by flow. You see here an example um, of ovarian cancers. We looked at CD44 and CD25. 
And uh, you see uh, the expression pattern in the uh, patient xenograft tumor. You see only a small fraction of um, CD24, CD44 double positive cells, so it's really, really low. When you put the cells, so dissociate the tumor, take them into culture, and generate a cell line that will be passaged over several times, and you check again for those two markers, you see an enrichment for uh, the double positive cells, which might point to uh, some kind of um, selection or something like that. However, when you take the cell line and put it back into a mouse and grow it as, as a tissue, you will see that it will resemble um, what, what you've seen in the first place. So uh, only a minor fraction of double positive cells with most, most of the cells only expressing C44, but not CD24. So this shows that you do not necessarily select for single clones that might have a, another expression pattern. Uh, what you observe in the cell line state is rather an adaption to the in, in vitro environment, which will be reverted once you put it back into an in vivo setting. So uh, you do not really introduce a bias. It's just a regulation that you will observe uh, in vitro. So this already brings me to the to the summary. So I hope uh, I hope that um, I've been able to show you that we have an optimized workflow um, with different uh, steps. Uh, starting with uh, tumor dissociation, which can be nicely optimi uh, optimized and also op uh, automated using the Gentlemax and our optimized tumor dissociation kits. Um, when you want to select thing, um, specific subpopulations or just get rid of non-tumor cells, uh, you can easily and um, quickly just use MEX technology to purify tumor cells or also select for a certain uh, set of, of interest. and um, this is something I didn't really uh, go into detail. Of course, you can use MEX technology when you have um, a primary, primary tumor or also a xenograft. You can isolate tumor cells. You can isolate stromal cells and generate co-cultures and different uh, specific ratios that you want and study different uh, co-culture models. And uh, finally, using the tumor marks media, which do not contain serum, you can now, without having to optimize uh, the um, addition of growth factors or cytokines or whatever, you can, for specific tumor cell types, um, generate your own primary cell lines. Um, you have, uh, you can generate first of all uh, primary cultures. So you have a time window of up to four weeks uh, to perform in vitro testing. From those, you will get some uh, stable cell lines that can be passaged and expanded in vitro, and um, these cell lines can um, also be used to uh, generate in vivo models, which will closely resemble patient tumors and the patient tumor heterogeneity in vivo to do more advanced and more um, yeah, complex testing in, in different um, yeah, settings or whatever you want to, uh, to do with in vivo models. Um, the data that I've shared, of course, are not uh, all generated by me alone. Um, I have to thank um, my, the whole group of my supervisor, Dr. Olaf Hart. So this is him and uh, all the people, uh, most uh, specifically uh, Anna, uh, Lena, and Alina, who've uh, helped me to uh, uh, yeah, develop and optimize the media, the cultural conditions, and tef test multiple things. Um, other uh, Milton colleagues like Andreas Posio or uh, Rita. And also, quite importantly, uh, some of the data are also generated by our uh, collaboration partner, Andreas Trump and Martin Sprick uh, from HiSTEM, without whom this uh, or the uh, development of those media would not have been, been possible. 